Hey everyone, Jonathan Sri Ranganathan here. We've just finished up the 2024 Brisbane City Council election campaign where I was running to be the mayor of Brizzy and Sam and I are going to have a little bit of chat about how the campaign went and some of our insights and lessons from it. We wanted to start by acknowledging country, paying respects to Yaga and Turbal peoples, recognising that sovereignty was never ceded and that there are many past wrongs and continuing injustices that are yet to be rectified. And yeah, I guess thinking deeply about the fact that we were running for office in an, a system of government which is arguably illegitimate in kind of the settler colonial context. But yeah, nonetheless, it was a really cool and interesting campaign to be part of. And I'm very grateful to Sam, who was one of many volunteers who helped out on the campaign. Sam, you were doing a lot of work managing a lot of our social media channels. So thank you for being part of it. I, I wanted to start by asking like, <laughs> Why did you get involved or what was one of the main reasons that drew you into the campaign? Yeah, look, um, it was really the brand that's around you as an individual. Mostly that was like, okay, this is a serious campaign that I need to get involved in. Um, you know, I, I had always just seen you at all the local actions and um, your name is is mentioned a lot when you're talking about um, progressive politics in Brisbane. Um, and just this... Uh, platform that you were running on where it was like those huge changes that we're wanting to see in the country to address, you know, the housing crisis, the cost of living crisis, um, homelessness, all of those things that we actually can do at the local council. That was just yeah. super energizing that we can actually see this right here in our backyards. Yeah, cool. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you got in bo on board. Thanks for being part of it. Yeah, it was so fun. No, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, look, I, it's now been three weeks. Uh, since the election. Um, I know you've had a couple of days off to relax. Um, and now that we're a few weeks on, I'm wondering how you're feeling. Yeah, good question. I actually, I often don't like talking much about my personal mental state because it's a, like a very like, yeah, it, you're giving away a lot of yourself, right? But I definitely, after the election was over, I was a bit like, whew, that was a big thing. So I think mm -hmm. I was a bit emotionally drained. I wouldn't say I was like, really depressed or like I didn't have a really rough time, but it was definitely good that I got to have a couple of weeks away from the city, went to the beach. My parents live at Caloundra. So just chilled out, did a lot of reading, played a lot of internet chess and like, <laughs> um, yeah, just sort of had a, a bit of downtime to reflect and rest. And that was really cool. I'm feeling now looking back on the whole thing, really proud and really yeah. happy with how we did the, like, we'll talk about this more, but we had a really good result for the Greens across the city and I'm pretty stoked that we managed to do that on a platform that was pretty like radical I guess is I, I don't love that term because I don't think our ideas that we're talking about are necessarily radical but it's yeah, a shorthand yeah. wave but uh so yeah I'm, I'm really pleased with that side of things obviously it would have been nice to win some more wards like you always like the the big aspiration was oh maybe we can knock the LNP out of office but that was always a real long shot and not kind of the primary goal of running but mm. um yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling really uh, interested to see what happens with the Greens in Brisbane going forward and also thinking about how that will relate to other activist movements and stuff. And I guess I'm yeah, kind of excited to work out what's next. Yeah, awesome. I'm really excited to talk about that a bit more. Um, I guess let's just start with unpacking the result. Um, mm. So we did see a pretty significant swing towards the Greens. I think the citywide was around 5.3%. Um, the mayoralty was 4.1% swing towards yourself, yep. um, which are incredible numbers um, for any election. Um, but as we said, the LNP are still in majority. Um, what's your read of what happened <laughs> yeah, in this election? So the there's 850,000 voters in Brisbane. So this is like the biggest electorate in the country effectively. And as you said, a sort of 5% swing is pretty phenomenal. We've kind of got used to big swings in Brisbane in the last few years with Greens campaigns. Uh, and so like in the context of that, sometimes 5% might not seem huge, but in an electorate of 850,000, that is a really big swing. Yeah. And we're now at the point where between one in four and one in five Brisbane residents are voting for the Greens ahead of the major parties. That's great. Like that is a historic high. That's really kind of highlights that the big swings to the Greens in the federal 22 election weren't an anomaly. A lot of mm -hmm. people were sort of wondering, oh, was that just a flash in the pan? Was that, that just a reaction against Scott Morrison? But it turns out, no, actually a lot of those people 
are still voting Greens and the Greens vote is continuing to grow. So, yeah, that's cool. I I guess the it's worth noting that the mayoral result is just slightly behind our average result across the wards because there were a couple of independent candidates and minor parties who ran for mayor. So, like, yep. the legalised cannabis party ran in the mayoral race and that, I guess, cost us a few percentage points in terms of primary vote. Once you sort of look at the preference allocations and where the votes flowed, the mayoral vote and the ward vote pretty much match. So mm-hmm. there wasn't a big difference between the Greens vote for individual wards versus the uh, the average vote for individual wards versus the mayoral vote. But yeah, the I think the disappointing thing is that although we got this big swing, uh, it mostly came off the Labor Party. And okay. yeah, the Liberals vote basically held across the city and... We can sort of unpack why that was a little bit more. But one thing that really struck me was that our swings were particularly strong in a lot of suburban areas. And so this election result, I think, really challenges the narrative that the Greens are just an inner city party. Like in Forest Lake Ward, which is like the far outer southern suburbs of Brisbane, working class migrant communities like Inala, Jurak, that sort of area. Mm -hmm. We got a swing of almost 10% out there. Like that is Huge. really, really big. And that was sort of repeated. Like suburb uh, wards like Maruka also had really strong, healthy swings on the the northwestern suburbs of uh, the inaugural ward, like a huge swing. I think it was close to 14%. That might be the single biggest swing to the Greens in Brisbane history. I think I had the previous record of a swing of around 13% when we first won the Gab Award. And yep. like, yeah, even better than that. So like some really big shifts not just in the inner city, but across the suburbs. And really what seems to have happened is that there were a lot of Labor voters who swung to the Greens. We also know that there were a fair chunk of Liberal voters who swung to the Greens. So we were winning votes off both parties. But then the Liberals were also winning votes off Labor. So the real story of this election is that the Labor primary vote kind of collapsed. It dropped significantly. And the Greens scooped up a lot of that and the Liberals won back some of that. And really what I think happened is that the Liberals ran a particular, a fairly smart campaign that was targeted at winning back the more conservative Labor voters. So they might, they basically gave up on really progressive voters. They weren't trying to, even some Liberal voters who are concerned about climate change or whatever, they didn't try to stop those people swinging to the Greens as much. They really worked on conservative voters who swing between Labor and the Liberals because they knew that even if the Greens won some votes off the Liberals and some votes off Labor, they would be able to defend their seats if they could just win a few votes back off Labor as well. So Mm -hmm. when you look at the results on paper, it looks like there was a big swing from Labor to the Greens and the Liberal vote barely moved. But the reality is more complex. There were swings to the Greens from both the major parties and then there was also a swing from Labor back to the Liberals. Okay, so Labor didn't really pull their weight and because <laughs> we rely on on preferences and um, things like that, we, we didn't quite get those preferences that we needed to win those seats. But we are, um, I think, the second um, largest vote in about 10 electorates. Yeah, so the Greens primary vote has now overtaken the Labor vote in about 10 of Brisbane's 26 wards, which is really strong. It's a good sign for the upcoming state election and the federal election. And yeah, I think should be like, I hope it's a lesson to the Labor Party that they need to stop sitting on the fence and kind of articulate a clear vision for the city. I don't want to spend too much time dissing other parties, but like really there, it wasn't entirely clear what Labor stood for that was markedly different from the LNP and Mm, mm -hmm. the Liberals had the luxury or the advantage this time of they were able to blame state and federal Labor for a lot of things that people are frustrated about, which meant that it was really hard for Labor councillors and the Labor mayoral team to win more votes in that context because so much of what people are frustrated about partly is the responsibility of higher levels of government. And yeah, the Liberals were pretty clever about deflecting and, you know, blame shifting. And so... I think, but yeah, the, and maybe we should talk about this more, but the challenge or like one of the challenges we set for ourselves as the Greens campaign was that we wanted to articulate a fairly bold policy platform and we did that and we still won a lot of votes. Yeah, I definitely do want to unpack that one a bit more. Yeah. Um, So yeah, I mean, our campaign was essentially a direct attack on car-centric urban planning 
on the gambling industry, on property developers, mm. and there is a lot of cash behind these groups. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess um, there's a, a criticism that I've heard amongst um, some green supporters or people that might be Labour Greens um, swing votes, um, and that is that we might have gone too bold or too far. Yeah. What do you make of that? Were we too radical? Yeah, I think this is a really good question, and it's something that we need to think about, not just in the context of this election campaign, but for sort of progressive or transformative political movements more generally. Because we often hear the narrative, oh, if your policies are too bold or too radical, you're going to turn people off and you won't win enough votes. And I think that can be a really corrosive narrative because it leads to movements self-censoring rather than calling for the changes they actually want to see. They call for these sort of incremental reforms that they think will be more palatable to conservative voters, but they're not actually what the movement wants to do either. And and yeah. so, uh, like, yeah, as you said, like in this campaign, we called for a freeze on rent increases. We called for a vacancy levy on empty homes, a crackdown on Airbnb accommodation, free and frequent public transport. We called for banning all poker machines from Brisbane City Council owned venues. Uh, we called for shutting down the Eagle Farm horse racing track and turning that into green space and public housing. As you said, these were big attacks on a lot of powerful interests. Uh, yep. I didn't even mention, yeah, property developers. Like a lot of our urban mm. planning policies really challenged the treatment of housing as a commodity. So, the yeah, there there were a few, definitely a few sectional interests and, and groups that we would have pissed off a little bit. And I'm fine with that because for me, part of the goal of running in this campaign wasn't necessarily to win the mayoralty. We honestly didn't think we had a particularly good shot at that. And we said that from the outset. One of the main goals was to uh, take ideas that had previously been considered really niche or uh, like not at all in the mainstream and push them out to a wider audience and build legitimacy for them. And that's kind of a multi-election project. Mm -hmm. And this is actually sort of the first Greens campaign in Brisbane where freezing rent increases has been like, at the top of the flyers and a core message right across the city. I've previously run in like the Gabba Ward calling for rent controls and so basically limits on how much rent can increase by. Yeah. But this time we were calling for a two-year freeze, so no rent increases at all. And that's the first political campaign, I think, in the country that's actively campaigned for a freeze on rent increases. And so... You know, in that context, that's a brand new idea for a lot of people. They're like, whoa, this guy is calling for this, what seems like a big step. And certainly a lot of landlords would have hated it. But now that it's out there and people have, uh, the next time we run on that in, say, the state campaign or the future federal campaigns, people will be more accustomed to the idea. It's mm -hmm. not like a brand new radical idea. And the same is true with a lot of those other ones we put out there. Like, I think this was the first time in Brisbane history that anyone seriously proposed shutting down the horse racing track. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And a lot of people lost their minds at that. They were like, that <laughs> is way too off the chain. But now that the idea is out there circulating, people will be digesting it. Maybe it'll be refined further. In future years, people will start to come back to that idea and be like, oh, maybe that's not so crazy. So mm. yeah, part of the goal of the campaign is to push out the, these ideas out there into the world, knowing that they're going to put some people off and attract some criticism and be seen as too extreme or whatever. But in the long term, we're shifting the parameters of debate. That term, the Overton window, like there's a sort of frame of ideas where this is what's seen as acceptable to discuss and anything outside the Overton window is too extreme. And and we've broadened that or shifted that so that ideas that were previously considered too extreme are now becoming more mainstream acceptable. But I think you're right that there were there would have been some voters for whom the platform was too bold. Like I don't want to overcount those people or like, but I think there would have been some people who looked at what the Greens had put on the table and were like, ah, oh, no, I'm just going to keep voting for the major parties. Mm -hmm. And for me as a candidate, I would rather um, run on the platform that I really believe in and not quite get over the line than run for stuff that I don't quite believe in, get elected and then not have a mandate to make the changes that we actually want to make. make. Like, yeah, yeah. Because we could have run a, f a more incrementalist campaign, small target, don't make any waves. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe we might have won some more seats. But then having won those seats, we wouldn't have actually had community support for the kinds of changes we want to introduce. Mm -hmm. So it's probably better, I think, to be honest about what you stand for and say, this is what we stand for. We're not hiding anything. Here's our vision for the city. If you like it, vote for it. 
rather than pretending that we stand for one thing when actually we want to do something else. But, yeah. but the like actually having said all that, despite having a really bold platform, we won heaps and heaps of votes. Like, yeah, come like on. Like tens of thousands of people voted Greens for the first time. And so I think for me, the evidence suggests that actually the bold platform worked. Like we've seen plenty of election campaigns around the country where the Greens have run more moderate, you quote unquote, moderate platforms or run on policies that aren't are seen as less radical or extreme. And they haven't gotten big swings. So we ran on a really bold platform and we got a big swing. And mm. so to me, then that's a, that's an evidence base to point to to say, actually, bold policies work. But I, I think we also have to be honest about the fact that a lot of people weren't voting on policy. In a city mm. council mm. election campaign, most voters are barely paying attention to, they don't know who's running exactly. They yep. only realize there's an election a few weeks before voting opens. They're not looking through mm. policy details. They're voting more on a general vibe of what's going on. And that's where I think the LNP were very strategic about defending the seats where they were under threat. Yeah, I'd love to go a bit further into that LNP strategy, the just vote one strategy. Um, but yeah, I just on that note of um, people in council elections not caring so much about policy. I mean, I met people um, that said that they vote purely on the name whichever name sounds the best. I'm hoping that vote went towards <laughs> you, surely. Um, but yeah, it's pretty shocking that um, there's really just, I, I guess, a sense of feeling disenfranchised or not understanding, I guess, the capacity of uh, council to instill this really systemic change um, that would really affect our lives. So Yeah, and I mean, it's worth mentioning that the turnout for this election was only 80%. So one in five Brisbane residents forgot to vote or couldn't be bothered voting. Whereas in state and federal elections, it's closer to sort of 95, 99%. Like, so we have compulsory voting for local government elections, but there's so little coverage of them. So people are getting distracted by other things in their lives. So a lot of people don't turn up to vote. And our theory, we it's hard to measure, but we think that a lot of those people who are a bit more disengaged or cynical of the political establishment might also be people who would have been more likely to vote Greens. Mm -hmm. Like I would I would be willing to bet money that uh, in a local government election, owner occupiers are more likely to show up to vote than renters are. Renters are moving around a lot. They're not paying as much attention to local government stuff. Mm -hmm. But obviously renters are one of our core voting demographics for the Greens. So the fact that a lot of renters and young people didn't turn up to vote probably hurt us more than it hurt the major parties. So yeah, yeah you know, that's one of the big challenges that's specific to local government. But I, as you said, I, a lot of people also don't realize the significance of local council. Once you sit down and have a conversation and you're like, here's how it matters. This is like housing and transport and how we transform the city to transform society. And people are like, oh yeah, cool. I get it. Yeah. But you have to have that conversation with people and yeah, yes. that it's fundamentally, it's just a problem of reach and how many people we have the resources to engage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, us, a small volunteer team educating a city as big as Brisbane um, on the capacity of council. I mean, it doesn't even sound like something that should be our responsibility <laughs> yeah. to do. I think definitely in this election, um, information, as is the case in so many elections around the world, um, was really a big factor. So, um I mean, I I spoke to people after the election that hadn't realised the election that happened the week before, mm. um, and also they would have voted green, so that was a shame. Um, I spoke to people that didn't understand whether they are um, voting one or whether they're numbering all the boxes, yep. and obviously you had LNP there with their signs that were just black and white, so you couldn't tell it was LNP advertising saying just vote one, just vote one, yep. and no matter what you'd say, like when we're on the booths, you know, you'd be you're like telling people policy and then over your shoulder you've just got LMP saying just vote one <sighs> so um yeah. yeah I guess what do you see uh maybe the state government or council can do to um get higher turnouts and I guess overcome this um information dilemma where we've got um huge misinformation campaigns yeah uh and then we've also just got basic voting information is is quite yeah, lacking. right. Like there's a real massive lack of political literacy of like what is preferential voting? How does it work? Mm. Like in the Brisbane campaign, we have optional preferential voting, which means that you don't have to number every box, uh, but it, it's better to number every box because then your vote still flows through. So even if your first preference doesn't get over the line, it flows through to someone else. So like people really ought to number every box, but for the Liberals, it, it was more 
uh, advantageous for them to just tell people to just vote one because then if a bunch of Labor voters voted one Labor and didn't preference the Greens or a bunch of Greens voters voted one Greens and didn't preference Labor, then those votes might evaporate and it served the Liberals. So the Liberals were actively kind of promoting a, a certain line that served their interests and there wasn't much cover, uh, coverage or yeah political education coming from the Electoral Commission or other mm. independent sources saying, hey, here's why it's better to number every box or here's what your options are. And I think as well the the bigger problem we really had was just that we were completely outgunned in terms of election campaign resourcing and financing. So the Greens had way more volunteers on the ground. Like we, mo I think we mobilised a couple thousand volunteers, which is huge for so local awesome. government election. That might be the biggest volunteer mobilisation for a council campaign in Brisbane history, maybe in Queensland history, I don't know. But even though we had a couple of thousand volunteers, that's still a pretty small proportion of a city of 850,000. Yeah. And there were lots and lots of people that we just couldn't reach by door knocking or one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so the way to reach those people was through digital advertising or conventional like billboard and TV advertising or like printed materials in the letterboxes. And the Liberal National Party spent millions of dollars on election advertising, whereas the Greens campaign budget was like a tenth of the size. And so that was really, I think, a decisive factor is that even if we had policies that we knew people liked, and even if we had a sort of broad message and narrative that we knew was swinging votes when we got to people, we just couldn't reach everyone in a city of almost a million people kind of thing. And so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I That was one of my um, big takeaways. This was my first political campaign that I worked so closely on. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just the fact, especially from doing a, a social media um, coordination type role, um, the fact that truth uh, doesn't actually cut through um, misinformation. Um, mm. And so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit more about the huge targeted campaign that the LNP ran, not just against the Greens, but the half a million that we estimate they've spent directly attacking you as a person. Yeah, yeah, like it was <laughs> kind of heavy to be on the receiving end. I remember you and I, a few weeks before election day, we were looking at some of our stats on social media and like feeling really good because we're like, mm. wow, we've had this many views on TikTok and we've reached this many people on Instagram. And like yep. they were big numbers for a, a campaign that was pretty much all run by volunteers. Like I was volunteering, you vol volunteering, everyone on our socials team was volunteering. And we were putting out a lot of content in different channels, explaining our policies, uh, explaining our broader vision for the city, et cetera, et cetera. And we were reaching tens of thousands of people, but the Liberal Party were reaching hundreds of thousands of people because they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on sponsored ads. And we just couldn't compete with that. I think the total digital advertising budget for the LNP looks like it was about a million dollars. Whereas our mayoral campaign spent a grand total of about $7,000 yeah. <laughs> on digital advertising. So they smashed us in terms of digital ad spend. Yeah, yeah. And what they did basically was that they constructed, uh, I, I use the term doppelganger, like a clone. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they constructed this second fake Jono who had a lot of elements of the real Jono, but kind of exaggerated and caricatured. So like, you know, I've said in the past, oh, I, I think it's ethically justifiable for people who are on low incomes to steal from Coles and Woolworths if they can't afford to feed their families. And the LNP took, took that out of context and they're like, Jonathan, promote shoplifting. Uh, and that is, as a one-off isolated attack would have seemed a bit silly. People are like, oh, that's not real. This is mm. just... but." they just had such a volume of materials like flies in the mailbox and digital ads and TV ads and billboard ads and all these different channels. And scratchies. Yes. They even, <laughs> they printed out scratchies that had like my face on it and then like lies about what I stood for when you wild. scratched off. Yeah. So, wild. so big money spent on that sort of stuff. And it, it wasn't just that they ran individual attacks, but they constructed this entire doppelganger Jono, like Jono the extremist kind of thing that was... Uh, so far removed from who I am as an actual person that like I looked at it and I was like, this isn't even me. I felt like I was watching a movie of someone else's life kind of thing. But in a lot of the city, that was the only thing that people were hearing from the Greens campaign. Like we didn't mm. have the money to get a letter in every single person's letterbox. Outside our inner city campaigns, we didn't really door knock everywhere. So 
there are lots of people who maybe if they were paying a lot of attention and were really engaged, they might've seen some of our commentary on social media or a brief snippet of me saying something in the TV or like mainstream news coverage. But mostly they were hearing about the Greens from the LNP's channels. And so the LNP had a two-step strategy. They had this first step was to really tie the Greens and Labor together. And they ran a lot of stories and messaging being like, Labor and the Greens have done a preference deal. Labor and the Greens have done a power sharing deal. Like Labor and the Greens, it's a coalition. They're one party. Yep. It was like lies. Like they were just <laughs> lying. But uh, there, there was a grain of truth, which is that if the Greens had won more seats and Labor had won more seats and we didn't have a majority, we would have worked together. Like yep. that's a matter of common sense that if what, no one party wins a majority of seats, that party has to work with other parties to pass laws and pass the budget and stuff. So there was a grain of truth that if after the election, the Liberals lost a bunch of seats, Labor and the Greens would have to work together to pass stuff. And so they took that grain of truth, turned it into this broad narrative of like, there's a dodgy power sharing deal between Labor and the Greens. A vote for Labor is a vote for the Greens. A vote for the Greens is a vote for Labor even though we were running against Labor and we're different yeah, parties. Yeah. Um, so they constructed that narrative. Labor and the Greens are in an alliance. And then they constructed the second narrative of Jono, this radical Greens extremist, is running for mayor. And so by doing that, there, there was a certain layer of conservative Labor voters who they're never going to vote Greens, but they're pretty solidly Labor. But then if they see that Labor's done this deal with this three, the extremist character, mm -hmm. that's enough for them to get nervous and switch back to the LNP. So yep. that I don't think the LNP attacks saying that I wanted to break into people's homes or that I endorse shoplifting or that I wanted to put up pet registration fees. Like it was all sorts of stuff. I don't think progressive engaged voters would have believed that stuff. But for people who weren't super engaged, who are only peripherally paying attention that would have been just enough to make them nervous about voting Labor and the Greens, and instead they swung back to the Liberals. So the Liberals were very effective at scaring voters, and it was a fear-based campaign about this sort of fictional boogeyman who wanted to break into their homes, and that was how they protected their primary vote enough to stop us winning seats. And so even though we got big swings off both the major parties, as I said, the Liberals were able to claw back just enough Labor voters as well. And... Yeah, it was kind of brutal. Like, I think we didn't fully realize the extent of that attack campaign that was targeted at me until the final weeks when, yeah. like, we'd seen one or two attack flies and then they just kept, kept coming. We're like, oh, God, yeah. this is, like, relentless. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think by the end of it, I was, like, feeling a little bit worn down and I'll post some more reflections on this that I'm writing up at the moment. But it, what it did do to me was made me uh, a little less sure of my own strategic judgment because when er like the, when so many people in the city are getting this message in being like, Jono's an extremist, Jono's divisive, Jono's a troublemaker, you start to internalize that a little bit. Like you don't realize mm -hmm. you're doing it at the time, but it just made me sort of become that little bit less confident in my own convictions and my own judgment, which then probably meant that I wasn't responding as effectively as I could have to those attacks. So yeah, there's probably some deeper lessons there that we'll talk about in other contexts later. Yeah, absolutely. And just like, I just wanted to acknowledge like we all have the utmost respect for you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you were just strong all the way to the end. Yeah, true, um, so. And I think, you know, I, I remember laughing at the first couple of um, pieces that they put out with um, you on the bicycle. Yeah, yeah. Um, this like really expensive, um, stupid animation. Um, and I remember initially it being a bit funny. Yeah. Um, but then over time, it really became evident that a lot of this was even racially coded. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I guess it, it has longer term implications for people that might be um, like pe people of color yeah. uh, or marginalized people. Um, like Yeah, I do worry about that, right? Because like, yeah. one of the, some of the main attacks that the, the LNP ran was this narrative that I wanted to break into people's homes, which is utter nonsense. Like mm. in the past, I've said, I can understand why people are squatting in a homelessness crisis. Uh, and they've like taken that out of context, turned that into narrative saying, Jono wants to break into people's homes and they put, took footage of me like from a video we put out like three years ago where I'm like looking into a window and then juxtaposed that with a headline saying crime will get worse under the greens, mm -hmm. like taking these little snippets of quotes, me talking about the housing crisis and squatting. And the, that should not have worked. Like, yeah. But it worked because the electorate was already primed or a proportion of the electorate was already primed to believe these racist tropes that people of colour are trying to break into your homes. Like there's such a moral panic at the moment about burglaries and 
youth crime and all this sort of mm, stuff. Immigration. Yeah, and so they'd all fed into it, like three the extremists, this migrant, non-white Australian who's wants to come into your community and take your house. Like it was, it's almost comical. Like when you mm. repeat, like this is ridiculous. I can't believe people fell for it. But some people did because there's that sort of baseline racism still in dominant culture Australia that made this stuff seem halfway plausible or legitimate. And I think you're right. I do worry that this will impact other people of colour in terms of whether they decide to run. But it will also impact elected representatives in terms of how much they self-censor and how bold they are in terms of challenging injustice. Because yep. every time as a as a politician or a candidate or whatever, you go to make a fo- Facebook post or you go to say something to the media or say something in a speech, you do have a little filter and you're like, oh, how could this be taken out of context? How could this be misused by my political opponents? How could they spin this? And that's always working in the back of your head. And Mm. me personally, I turn that filter right down. And I'm like, no, I'm going to speak truth to power. I'm going to say what needs to be said. I don't care too much if they spin it and take it out of context later. And that's how I've operated over the past sort of eight years as an elected representative. Mm -hmm. And it served me quite well because it meant that I was able to effectively challenge oppression and build a platform for these bold ideas and all that sort of stuff. But I do worry that other elected representatives will see the way that liberals attacked me and think, oh, geez, if I say the sorts of things that Jono has said, they'll come and attack me next as well. And so we'll end up getting people of colour elected into positions of power, but they won't feel confident enough to be really bold and assertive in challenging oppression. Yeah, And that is, that is, I think, a legitimate concern. Mm. But it's important to remember that our political opponents are going to attack us regardless of what we say. And it, we even saw that in this campaign where... They did just make stuff up as well. Like they yeah. just made up absolute lies. Like they told people that we wanted to drop every street in the whole city to 30 kilometers an hour, which is not true. They told people that we wanted to put up pet registration fees, yeah. which is not true. <laughs> like, so they, they're willing to lie about us anyway. So mm. if they're going to lie and to attack us, we, we might as well be honest about what we stand for and be upfront about it. And to come back to one of your earlier questions, one of the challenges we have in Australian politics is that there are no rules requiring truth in political advertising. Mm -hmm. So you can legally just lie about your political opponents and there's no independent umpire to determine what's truth or not. And part of the reason for that is that it is a little bit tricky to say, okay, who gets to decide what's true? Because sometimes it's really clear that two plus two equals four. But if, if one party makes a claim about another party, who is this independent umpire that we trust to determine who's right? Mm. And so setting up, robust truth in advertising laws can be a little bit difficult, but other countries have done it. And there's probably an argument to be made that we need some kind of rules framework in Australian politics to ensure that parties can't just lie about each other overtly. Because as we've seen with this campaign, the parties with the most money will spend that resource in telling lies about their political opponents. And so, yeah, like I said, the LNP outspent us 10 to one, maybe yeah. even more. Um, And so in that context where you've got very loose limits on how much money parties can spend, you also don't have any rules against lying about your political opponents, then like that's really hard for insurgent parties to crack through and Mm -hmm. and really sort of reinforces the status quo. And yeah, that's that's a particular challenge with local government because you've got these local councillors who have all the advantages of incumbency. They're paid full time to be local councillors, to talk to their community, to build relationships, to cut the ribbon at the playground opening and to, yeah. you know, <laughs> give out the community grants to the PNC and all that sort of stuff. So they have all these advantages of incumbency and then they also have more money than us and they can also lie about us. So it's like a pretty steep hill to climb. And in that context, the fact that we got such big swings and the fact that we picked up Paddington Ward and won that off the LNP is still pretty remarkable and really yeah. positive. So. Yeah, like I said at the start, I'm really happy with the result. I think yeah. like under the circumstances, we we did really well, but I do think we need to get more sophisticated and strategic about how we respond to political attacks because for the last couple of election campaigns where the Greens have won stuff, including in the recent federal election, the major parties didn't really see us coming. They wrote us off as politically irrelevant. They're like, no, no, the Greens aren't important. They just focused on attacking each other. This time, both Labor and the Liberals put resources towards attacking the Greens. Mm-hmm. They saw us as a real threat. And and as a result, we had like the full guns of the Liberal Party turned on us. Yeah. And also Labor attacking us from time to time. Mm-hmm. So that made it much, much harder. And I think looking ahead, the Greens are going to have to get, yeah, a bit smarter about how we respond to attacks because we can't just ignore them and pretend they're not happening. They're going to cut through. 
Absolutely. I mean, this is a conversation that we could go on forever. Yeah. Um, we should probably wrap it up. Yeah, 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 we should wrap up. So um, I guess, look, we've had this campaign, these six months of campaigning. And um, from a social media perspective, even, we've got a huge platform. We've got a lot of engagement happening online. Um, you are a household name for a lot of households in Brisbane, whether it's for good reasons yeah. <laughs> or for LNP propaganda reasons. Um I'm wondering, what are you going to do next? Because I, there are so many people um, even like commenting on your socials being like, oh, please become the prime minister. Please run to be an MP. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, I know that you've got a lot of options. What are you feeling yeah. at the moment with um, where you're going to make the most impact? Good question. Uh, I'm still deciding is the honest answer. Like definitely people have asked me to run for higher levels of government and I'll think about that. But I, I'm a musician and like a performance poet and there's sort of that whole like career pathway waiting for me. And I'm kind of like after seven years of city council, I'm like, oh, I just want to go back to doing more gigs and writing more poetry and, and music and that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's really tempting. You're right though, that we've got this big social media platform and this big reach and it feels like we should be trying to use that in sort of a political commentary context. So I guess I'm, I'm really interested in what our audience has to say. So if you have feedback for us and you're like, hey, Jono, you and your crew of volunteers, you need to talk more about this or can you please do a regular thing like this? Like, let us know what you want from us because mm. if there's a lot of people saying, hey, we'd really like this podcast to continue or we'd really like Jono to be writing more articles about urban planning and local government issues, like I'm very open to feedback because I'm kind of working out where am I best used and what's the best use of my time. So yeah, if people want to tell me flick me an email or whatever and like if you just want me to write more poetry and make more music i'll happily do that too <laughs> but yeah like this this week uh i'm flying down to sydney uh to help the new south wales greens plan for their local government election so they've cool. got me on board for a couple of days just to do some planning around community voting and participatory budgeting so i'm really looking forward to heading down there and to linking up with some of the sydney greens crew and i'll be around for the state election and supporting Greens candidates to run and hopefully we can win a bunch more state seats as well. So I'm definitely going to stay involved in that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, still kind of working out what's the best pathway. Uh, but I I guess I, before we wrap up, I did just also want to say once more a massive thank you to everyone who was supporting the campaign in some capacity, particularly to our active volunteers, because there were hundreds of people who donated their time to deliver letters or to talk to voters or to help us produce content. We had a, even a bunch of volunteers just helping me respond to emails. Thank you so much to all those people. Uh, and thanks to everyone who sort of voted for me and who had my back and to all those people in the social media comments threads who were like defending me when the attacks got really vicious. <laughs> so yeah, thank you to all of you. And thank you to Sam and like you and the rest of the crew who are volunteering on the social media team did an amazing job of like churning out content and taking what I'd said and repackaging it. So like, thank you. Um, and I guess, yeah, like thinking ahead, the, the final point I want to leave people on is just to remind everyone that it's not enough to just vote for change. We actually have to get active. And yep. in this campaign, we had more volunteers than ever before and we swung more votes than ever before. And and it would be really great to see more people step up and get involved in Greens campaign in, in different contexts, but also to get more involved in other forms of activism, whether that's supporting civil disobedience campaigns. There's a lot going on in response to the Palestine genocide at the moment, but on the ground direct action in your community as well, volunteering with people who are distributing food to people in need or for community garden projects or community art projects, like uh, even just consciousness raising, doing that work of sharing ideas, sharing stuff on social media, talking about issues that are important to crack people out of their programming and make them pay yeah. attention to the changes we need in society. There's lots of stuff you can all do out there to help the movement for social change. And so, yeah, I guess if you've been following along passively, but not stepping up to do much, I hope I can encourage you to find pathways in your life where you can carve out a bit more space for for doing some of this work because it like I said it's not enough to just vote every 3 or 4 years and then cross your fingers that we get a good result we mm. need to be mm -hmm. actively engaged in pushing against systemic oppression and and the political establishment and that's a it's a big task but the more of us who get on board with that the easier it'll be yeah, absolutely and look I just wanted to as well congratulate you on just such a massive bold, um, steadfast campaign that you ran. Um, yeah, you've. I, I know that even just what I've seen uh, online on the socials, 
we had people all across the country and even people around the world that were watching our campaign because of the platform that we ran on. Um, and so I think you've inspired a lot of folks. You so, too. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for listening, everyone. We'll catch you around. Thank you.